Richard, I know you have a particular interest in East Africa um, and the revivals that took place there. What do you feel we can learn from them? Well, I suppose one thing about revival is that you cannot make it happen. You, you can't say, well, if we do this and this and this, then we'll get revival. don't think so. It's ultimately a sovereign act of God's Spirit. When it touches a certain person, situation, maybe just three or four people, and something begins to happen. It's God's way of operating, and often he'll take some quite insignificant person or situation, and out of that will come new life and creativity. I learned that partly from the East African Revival. Do you feel there were any distinct characteristics about the revivals in East Africa that translate to uh, other parts of the world, or that show us how God normally works, or was it exceptional? I suppose when you get a, a reviving work of God by the Spirit, it's something that in a way seems quite exceptional. I mean, we had our own, what, the evangelical revival of 200 years ago, um, and that was something quite remarkable, 250 years ago with the Wesleys. Um, in East Africa, it happened really through a man called Joe Church, who I got to know as Uncle Joe, I called him, because uh, he was, uh, of course, older than me. But God met this man, who was a, a medical doctor from Britain. And uh, it was in the middle of a time of drought and of plague in the particular area where he was in Rwanda, and of great privation. And feeling completely empty, he got together with two of his African colleagues, the hospital dresser, with somebody called Yosia Kinuka, and another man called Simeone Nsibambi. I got to know both those men when I was just a little boy, of course. This is years back. And I didn't know how... how uh, exactly it was that they were involved but what happened was those three men met under a, a, a thorn tree outside Kigali in the capital and they met together and said we're feeling empty our country is empty our churches are in a bad way it's just nominal Christianity there nothing else how can we come alive ourselves we feel so empty they devoted themselves to the scripture and looking at the, the Bible together and bit by bit they came awakened and then they spread that, shared their stories with others, and about another ten became awakened. Then it would, grew to a hundred. Then the hundreds grew to thousands. And ultimately the thousands grew to millions. Right across not only Rwanda, but also Uganda, Kenya, where we lived on the lower slopes of Mount Kenya, uh, and Tanzania as well, even into the Sudan. And what happened was that the, the, the message of the cross was the big thing, rediscovering what, how, how much God loves us and how he wants to save us from all that ruins our relationship with him and how our sins are forgiven. The blood of Christ was right there at the very centre of the East African revival. Mm. That's the big thing. That is that, but then also deep-seated repentance. Mm. So there's a moral thing at the centre of any real awakening of God. And that... Uh, People were returning hoes and in the agricultural implements that they'd stolen from the government by the thousand. This was happening in places like uh, Tanzania when the revival came down. Mm -hmm. People would go right across uh, the countryside to put right something that they'd done wrong with somebody else. People would, about two o'clock in the morning would go along to church. And I must get right with the Lord. I've got to put things right. I've done wrong. Mm -hmm. Repenting. So, Deep-seated moral repentance is at the heart of any great awakening. Great focus upon the cross, and of course it's wonderful sequel, the resurrection, mm. the living Jesus. Then also hundreds of thousands of conversions to Jesus Christ. Mm. By the hundreds and thousands, sometimes whole villages would turn en masse to the Lord. That, that also, and then deep-seated prayer, intercessing, intercessory prayer, would take place on a large and widespread scale. People would simply meet and pray and pray and pray. And I suppose last of all, uh, inspired preaching, mm. again, of the cross. Actually, when you look at any uh, book of hymns, ancient hymns, that's a dead giveaway as to when a reviving movement happened. So when you look at some of these old hymn books, again and again it's on the cross, on my relationship to the Lord, how he's brought me out of uh, darkness into light, how he saved me from my sins, 
how he's given me a membership of his kingdom, eternal life, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end mm -hmm. of the age. That's always a dead giveaway as to where the centre of any great movement is. You just look at his hymn books mm -hmm. and you find that suddenly with East African Revival. Two questions I've got for you, Richard. First of all is, um, how do you understand what has happened subsequent to that revival time in Rwanda, for example? Exactly. That's a very how important you... question. Because, as we know, there was a time of great uh, trouble in Rwanda with the genocide. Mm. When you actually inquire closely as to what actually happened, none of the saved ones, as they were called, were involved in murder. None of them. It was uh, others who were involved in the murdering between the two tribes. Um, so that, that's what they called them, the Balokali, the saved ones, the members of uh, the people who'd entered into a revived relationship with the Lord. That does seem to be very strongly uh, the situation. Those who were really saved did not go in for all of this intertribal strife. So that the revival itself crossed the tribal barriers and boundaries? Yes, in one or two situations, when uh, some, perhaps some gunmen would come to a church mm -hmm. and they'd say, please, let's bring out all those of the Hutu. And then the others would say, if they're going to come out, we will come out with them. So then they'd all be murdered together. That happened on more than, more than one occasion. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of the bond that they felt in the blood of Christ that united them to each other. Do you think revival is going to come to Britain? Who knows? There's some wonderful bright spots in Britain today. Uh, the more I go around, the more I find myself encouraged in church after church where I go and preach to find the new life that there is there in stacks of churches. I'm not saying that there's a revival exactly, not as we understood it in, in East Africa. On the other hand, you know, if you go back 250 years when the Wesleys were beginning to preach and people like Bishop Butler were saying it's come to be taken for granted that Christianity is no longer a subject of any interest to ordinary people. The Wesleys came in and they said, in effect to each other, we are going to change the course of history. They just preached and preached and preached. They didn't know what would happen. But actually out of it came a great renewing movement right across Britain in fact, we were spared the horrors of the French Revolution because we had a Bible revolution over here. Mm. And so we can't predict what's going to happen, but our belief surely must be that when people are obedient to the Lord, when the Bible is set free, God, in his sovereign action, he may choose the time and place when it happens and the person to whom it happens. It's his will, it's his act. And we can believe that such a thing can certainly happen to Britain, yes, even today. Rich, thank you.